Hi there. Today we're going to be talking about our high risk um, newborns. And these are our babies that are going to be um, getting a higher level of care in our NICU, our neonatal intensive care unit. It's beyond the scope of this course to talk about the nursing care of these babies, uh, except for just very briefly. But this lecture is really in anticipation of you going to your NICU observation day. And that's for my live students. The other people that might find this um, lecture helpful is anyone going through a maternal child course and um, getting just a glimpse into our, our little list of patients. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so here we are with chapters 23 and 24, and we're going to cover nursing care, slightly nursing care of the newborn with special needs. We're really just gonna talk about the disease processes and acquired and congenital conditions. There will be some pictures in this um, slide presentation of babies that are in the NICU with various um, procedures that are happening. So uh, probably not uh, meant for children. So, Things that affect fetal growth, maternal nutrition, if she, if mom is not able to eat uh, appropriately, or if she has um, certain conditions like hyperemesis, gravidarum, or other conditions, illnesses that are keeping her from taking in proper nutrition, then our baby is going to go without. Um, sometimes it's genetics. Some babies are born on the smaller side. Some babies are born on the larger side, and we'll talk more about that. How well the placenta is functioning, it plays a big role in how our babies um, develop and environmental factors like infection, toxins, um, that sort of thing. So the birth weight variations, we have appropriate for gestational age, which is approximately 80% of newborns that have what we call a quote, normal height, weight, head circumference, and body mass. Then we have small for gestational age, meaning they um, are the right gestational age, but then they didn't grow uh, up to that average. And then we have large for gestational age. So spend just a minute and let's think about what disease processes that we've already talked about might contribute to a small for gestational age baby and what might contribute to a large for gestational age baby. So a small for gestational age baby might be um, the mom that has preeclampsia or hypertension or placenta previa or a slight placental abruption early on. Um, these are babies that didn't get what they needed through that exchange through the placenta. And the babies that, um, the mamas that have hypertension, all of those vessels are really clamped down and are occluding the blood flow to that baby. It's like kink in a garden hose you just get a trickle out the other side. And then our large for gestational age baby, that would be our baby that is being um, blasted with high amounts of blood sugar from our uh, diabetic mom, whether it be a gestational diabetic or a type two diabetic. So these are babies that we expect to grow um, large because of the growth hormone effect of the insulin and the high blood sugars. So then we have some um, other uh, delineations. We have our very low, I'm, I'm sorry, our low birth weight, which is under 2,500 grams or 5.5 pounds. So we start, we do use grams when we're talking about um, newborns. And then we have our very low birth weight infant, which is under 1,500 grams or three pounds, five ounces, and then extremely low birth weight infant, which is under a thousand grams. And so here is an example of those birth weights that um, vary quite a bit. And you can tell this baby is premature by this frog-like posture, and that's what this is showing. That's a classic posture for a premature baby because they just don't have the muscle development to, uh, they just are showing you that they don't have the muscle development. So this is a good picture of the three different classifications of birth weight. So here we would have average birth weight, low birth weight, very low birth weight. And I don't have a picture of extremely low birth weight um, here. So when we're talking about small for gestational age, these are the babies that had growth restriction. And um, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as IUGR, inner uterine growth restriction. 
and there's asymmetric versus symmetric, and we're not going to get too deeply into this, but we really want it to be our, our baby's brain to have gotten what it needed. So we hope to see those large heads and smaller bodies versus everything being um, proportioned because we don't want the brain to have been um, uh, deprived at all. And there are some contributing factors and you can spend some time in your text looking at the contributing factors that go to this condition. So our assessment, again, we want that head to be disproportionately large, that's what we prefer. Sometimes it, um, we have this appearance of muscle wasting, loose skin, there is a decreased amount of breast tissue. Um, sometimes there's a sunken appearance in the scaphoid abdomen. It kind of looks like it's sunken in. We'll have wide skull sutures and a very thin umbilical cord. And these are just babies that simply that um, uh, think of the garden hose again, that garden hose was kinked and they weren't getting what they needed. They typically grow pretty quickly once they are out. So some of our co common problems we see with our small for gestational age baby is perinatal asphyxia. This is not getting enough oxygen during the birth process or right after. They have difficulty with thermal regulation because they don't have the fat stores. Newborns already are um, poorly adapted to thermal regulation early on. So a baby that doesn't have, uh, that has even less fat stores is going to have a harder issue. Many of these babies do end up um, in the NICU for a time in an isolate with a warming device to help them conserve energy because it takes energy to keep yourself warm. We see issues with hypoglycemia, polycythemia, so too many red blood cells, we are going to cause our jaundice issues. And we'll talk more about that. We did a little bit in our normal newborn lecture, and then we're going to talk more about it here. Um, we do see issues with meconium aspiration, and there's that hyperbilly that goes with the polycythemia. Um, uh, and then the other thing we have to be leery of is birth trauma. Because these babies are smaller and more fragile, we worry about the interventricular hemorrhage and some of the other things that can happen um, to our little babies. So our nursing management for our small for gestational age babies, and you might see some of these out on the floor depending on um, policy, but four pounds and some change might be out on the floor. So we have to be thinking about some of these conditions that we're not used to seeing with our term um, uh, average weight babies. So we want to make sure that we're watching those uh, measurements very closely. We're going to be doing serial measurements to compare their blood glucose monitoring, bottle signs, we need to be watching very closely to make sure that they're not showing any signs of re respiratory, um, uh, respiratory distress. We want early and frequent feedings. This IV dextrose, this is going to be, again, based on policy and based on um, the level of NICU care that you have available at your facility. And then watching for those signs of polycythemia and developing jaundice and anticipatory guidance, letting these um, parents know that these babies, if they're out on the floor, are in a special category and need to be watched a little more closely and handled a little more closely, um, not allowing them to get cold and whatnot and watching those feedings, than you would a term average weight baby. And then here's our large for gestational age baby. And um, again, these babies are responding to the high blood sugar that they got from their moms. Sometimes moms grow big babies and it's in their history. Um, so it's not always diabetes. Sometimes they're just big. Maternal obesity can be a contributing factor. Being a male fetus can be a contributing factor. And then certain heritage heritages um, will uh, contribute to this. So certain places in the world just have big babies. Some of the characteristics here, they're going to have a large body, a very plump full face, they have very poor motor skills sometimes. So these big babies don't have the muscle development to control their weight. So these little babies didn't have the muscle development at all. And the big babies don't have the muscle development to control their weight. So sometimes they can be actually very poor feeders and um, have respiratory issues. And they might have um, difficulty regulating their behavioral states. So 
uh, uh, inconsolable crying or sleeping, uh, uh, sleeping too much. So it can be on either end of the spectrum. And this is that big guy again. This is um, infant of a diabetic mother, had to go into the NICU, needed respiratory support. They frequently have congenital heart defects that go along with this condition, has to be fed. Uh, this is a, a, a OG tube. If it's in the nose, it's gonna be an NG tube. And then is getting um, IV support, uh, probably blood sugar support through the IV. So these babies can um, actually be in the NICU for quite some time. So again, the issues that we might see with our LGA babies is birth trauma. These big guys don't fit through the pelvis as well. Hypoglycemia, um, polycythemia, again, they're at high risk for uh, hyperbilly. And we'll talk more about billing in just a minute. So nursing management is going to be similar for all of these conditions. Again frequent bottle signs. Just because you have a policy that says you need to do it every four hours doesn't mean that you can't do it in less time than that because you feel the need to based on your assessment. So don't get caught up in, well, it's not time for vitals yet. If you feel like there's something going on with the baby, the nurse's job, the first role of a nurse is always assess. So you're going to assess, get those vital signs, and then go on through the nursing process from there. Okay, looking at our gestational age variations. So we consider a term baby born from the first day of the 38th week through 42 weeks. This is according to your textbook. Now, in the practice, in the, in the, at the facilities, in the, I like to say the practice world, because that's where we're out there practicing nursing, right? In the practice world, um, you're probably never going to see a baby at 42 weeks if they had prenatal care, because typically they are induced long before that. Um, yet we also do not encourage delivery before the 39th week. So if a mom comes in and labor and delivers before 39 weeks, then there's nothing for us to do. We don't try to stop it, but we don't have elective inductions, um, inductions that don't have a medical reason before that 39th week. We know these babies need to stay in until at least 39 weeks. So if they're, we consider them preterm if they're born before 37 weeks, late preterm is that 34 to 36 weeks, and postterm is officially beyond 42 weeks, but we would call anything after 41-ish weeks postterm. That's just based on um, some evidence that there is much higher risk to a fetus after the 40 second week. So they will start that induction process in the 40, into the 41st week. So some of the things that we worry about with a post-term newborn is that placenta getting old and the inability to provide what it needs. So what kind of tests might we be doing on this pregnancy? If we have a post-term um, pregnancy, we'll be looking at that NST, non-stress test, and that um, biophysical profile very frequently. If you don't know what those are, you need to go back and look at the other videos or, or do some research because those are very important in our post-term newborn. The other thing we might see is the vernix, which is the soft, um, cheesy lotion uh, substance that covers the skin is pretty much gone by this point. And so that um, is what keeps them waterproof on the inside. So you might see their skin is very dry and cracked. There might be meconium staining or meconium in the fluid. And that's because um, the, as the, we know that there's a higher risk of the baby letting loose of that meconium, which is the stool that's blocking the gut be, it, when it's post-term. So we are concerned about that. Um, you're going to see creases covering the entire soles of the feet. We're gonna talk about how to determine a baby's gestational age here in just a minute. You might see a very thin umbilical cord and again, that limited vernix. So here's some pictures of a post-term baby. These are, the, there's that peeling skin. You can tell this baby had meconium because that's what all this staining is. And then these creases all the way down the foot are showing you that this is a very well-developed baby. Um, some of the problems that we see, we worry about meconium aspiration, maybe getting a big deep gulp of that meconium fluid if it's there. Also, hypothermia, polycythemia again, 
hypoglycemia and perineal asphyxia, pretty much the same problems that we see we've talked about with all the disease processes. So some of the things that we're going to do for nursing management is watching those blood glucose levels very closely. There'll be a policy that is, um, if you have an infant of a diabetic mother, that you'll be watching these very closely. We also want to watch their heat loss because they're using a lot of energy. And if their blood glucose is low, then they might actually be cold. And that's one of our first signs of hypoglycemia is the temp instability. So some of the things that lead up to a preterm delivery, you might see all of these infection, inflammation. We've talked about some of the infections that um, uh, distress our, our pregnancies, um, maternal or fetal stress. It might be a maternal reason, it might be a fetal reason, bleeding, and then the stretching of that uterus. So one of the reasons we often see multiples come early is because that uterus is stretched to its limit at an earlier time because there's more than one fetus inside. So we know that that can contribute to um, preterm delivery. So this is an isolate. Uh, here I'm just trying to give you some pictures. Um, these babies that are born early are neurologically not ready to be in the world. So sometimes we will put them in an isolate for a couple of reasons. It is to maintain the temperature. You can see down here that it's temp controlled. It's also to maintain a um, protective environment, almost womb-like, and to help them transition to their extra uterine life. And that's why they cover them with blankets and make it completely dark sometimes. It's okay to do that because we have these babies on a monitor. We know what their cardiac, respiratory, and oxygen status is at all times. So we can cover them up and not have them in our visual line of sight because we're watching them on that monitor. But all of these systems still need to develop respiratory, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, renal, immune system, and central nervous system. So a lot of the immune properties that a fetus gets actually happens in the last trimester. And so if a baby is born early, it's even more at risk for infection than a baby that would, is born at term. This is why it's imperative that you do not visit the NICU um, if you have any signs of illness or if there's any possibility that you could be sick. Um, I cannot stress that enough. Uh, these babies' lives depend on it. So some of the preterm characteristics that we see, these babies have poor muscle tone. I've already talked about them having minimal subcutaneous fat. Sometimes you'll see that their ear pinea, the top of their ear is, is poorly formed and still very flexible. Sometimes they're covered with lanugo, that fine hair. If they're very, very early, they might still have um, fused eyelids. They have very soft, spongy skull bones. They have absent a few creases in their soles and palms, very thin, transparent skin, undescended testes. Their um, labia is very prominent and abundant vernix. So there's going to be some pictures of some very preterm babies. So this baby, you can see these creases are not covering this foot. They're, they're, they're slowly developing, but they are not covering. So this is a really quick little assessment of where your baby is in its gestation. If the, your creases are covering that entire foot, we can assume that we are near or past term. If the creases are about two thirds of the way down the foot, then we're probably in the late preterm period. And if we don't have creases at all, we're in the very um, preterm period. This is an example of, um, I'm going to guess maybe 28 to 30-ish weaker, and you can see lots of things go into supporting all those systems that aren't developed yet. So you can expect to see NG tubes or, o, uh, or OG tubes. You'll expect to see possibly some respiratory support. I'm going to show you the different types that we use. Almost all of these babies will have um, IVs. They'll have an O2 stat monitor that we will um, change frequently, and then they will be on a cardiac monitor that will also tell us about their breathing. Some of the things our preterm babies aren't quite ready to do yet. Neurologically, sometimes their little systems aren't completely finished with their wiring, and so they will have what we call brady, bradycardia and desaturation, and um, it's not uncommon to happen in the NICU. Uh, we won't be 
scared about it. If it happens when it's in the NICU, it's expected in our premature babies. And that's why they're on cardiac monitors. And your nurse will guide you into what, if any, um, intervention needs to happen. But no need to panic if you see that happening. That's, that's an expected finding in our premature babies. And we don't send them home until they're done with that. Here are um, just a sample of these very low birth weight babies. I just want you to see how um, very small they actually are. This one's probably 26, 27, 28 weeks. And then here's another little one, got that startle reflex going. Um, sometimes you'll see different um, tools used, very soft opsites used if they've had skin tears or have some um, skin breakdown. Remember their skin is very thin. They are um, at high risk for infection. This is why we do a three minute scrub. We don't wear our fingernails past our, um, uh, the end of our finger and we don't use any artificial nails. We don't wear jewelry or a watch because that can um, harbor bacteria and we don't go in if we're having any signs of illness. So this is an example of um, CPAP. And so this is using the nasal prongs. They're no, they're, these babies are so friable and fragile that actually these devices will need to be changed every four hours because we can actually alter the structure of their face if we leave something in there too long. And so you'll see that if a baby is receiving respiratory support, they'll go from um, prongs to a mask to prongs, to a mask, and so on and so forth. And then this is how these babies are um, receiving food. So our preterm problems, again, we're looking at hypothermia, hypoglycemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and our immaturity um, of the immune system. So what are we doing? What is the NICU job, NICU nurse's job? Really all of those systems we're supporting. So oxygenation if need be, thermal regulation, nutrition and fluid balance, infection prevention, either with antibiotics or just prevention by good hand washing and, and um, taking care of the bedding and making sure that they're um, kept clean. We decrease that stimulation because like I said, neurologically, they're not ready to be here. So we don't rock our preterm babies or sit in a chair and, and pat them very strongly. We don't tap on the glass of the isolate or um, touch them constantly. They need time to grow and mature and they need to be left alone to do that. So we typically in the NICU do what's called touch time or care time. And so when it's time to do the assessment and feeding and changing, we do all of it at one time. And they, uh, most NICUs encourage the parents to be there during those touch times so that we aren't constantly interfering with this baby's sleep. Um, for discharge, there's a lot of things that need to happen in order for this baby to be ready for discharge, including getting the parent confident and ready in caring for a baby that was um, preterm. And this is just showing you, again, this is an NG tube. These are watched very closely before anything is put in an NG tube. Um, we are going to obviously check it and make sure that it's in the right place. We certainly wouldn't want to put um, breast milk or formula into the lungs. And then these are the critical components of discharge planning. All of these things need to happen. And I'm not going to go through all of it here. That's really beyond the scope of this class. But I just want you to see that really discharge planning starts on the day of admission for these babies. And there's, it's a lot more in depth than if you're sending home a um, term baby without any of these conditions. So our late preterm baby, I just spend a minute here talking about that 34 to 36 week baby. These babies, there's typically left out on the floor, but these are nocturne babies and they can have some of these same conditions that I was mentioning that would need a higher level of care. So as the postpartum nurse or the labor and delivery nurse that is um, working in the uh, family care or postpartum um, arena, we absolutely need to be on the lookout for these late preterm issues. Hypoglycemia, hypothermia, hypothermia we are just obsessed with temperature. A baby that is hypothermic could be brewing an infection, could be hypoglycemic, 
could just not be ready to maintain its own temperature. And those are, it's a very big time. So we have to watch that very closely. And then of course, dealing with perinatal loss, there is always that possibility in the NICU. Um, we have leaps and bounds grown our neonatal uh, nursing care and, and medical care in the last 20 or 30 years, but things still can happen, unfortunately. And so um, sometimes this is very difficult for a NICU nurse to kind of um, comprehend, uh, especially a new NICU nurse. Hopefully during your training, you will be exposed to a little bit about um, your processes in your, in your unit. And um, it's okay to have feelings. And to, especially if you have been dealing with the family, um, it's okay to show empathy. It's okay to uh, practice some self-care and maybe have a trusted colleague or possibly even a therapist to talk about these experiences. Perinatal loss is um, extremely difficult to deal with. Okay, so now we're gonna move on and talk about chapter 24. These are our acquired and congenital conditions. This sweetie most likely has um, Down syndrome or trisomy 21, you can see from his features. So acquired disorders typically occur at or soon after birth. And these are things that happen during the pregnancy or at birth specifically. There's possibly no identifiable cause. Congenital are present at birth and they're typically um, some problem with inheritance. And so these are going to be your trisomies or your um, uh, congenital defects or disorders that didn't form completely. And we're just gonna to touch on a few just so you've heard the terms. I'm not gonna go into depth uh, or show you pictures of all of them. So our acquired conditions, these are the things that happen during pregnancy or, and birth or shortly after. There's that asphyxia again. Neonatal asphyxia is the thing we worry the most about during labor and delivery. And that's why we're using the fetal monitor to try to determine which babies are, are oxygenating and which babies are not. Transient tachypnea and respiratory distress syndrome and meconium aspiration are the next big worries because we are, this baby's got to breathe on its own. As soon as that cord is cut, these are the things that we're looking for. Um, PPHN, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, that's really a disease process. Most often that comes from something else, meconium aspiration or, or, or severe prematurity. Our inner ventricular hemorrhage are babies that are born on the lower birth weights or that have had, um, this is a very rare potential side effect of vacuum or forceps delivery, those um, uh, uh, instrument deliveries that we talked about before. And our premature babies are at higher risk for inner ventricular hemorrhages and then those can cause um, damage to the brain. NEC is something that's developed in the gut. It is um, uh, basically the death of the gut and it is kind of the scourge of uh, prematurity. There are certain things that put you more at risk for NEC, one of them being premature delivery. Infants of diabetic mothers. Um, we've already talked about the things that can happen there. We, those babies need some help to continue on their development. There's birth trauma, uh, shoulder dystocia specifically. Um, we'll talk more about that in just a second. We will spend some time talking about our um, newborns of perinatal substance abusing mothers, um, just a brief amount. There's a really great video on my YouTube video list um, that shows some of the experiences of these babies and the people that are taking care of them and the moms. Um, we could really spend a whole class on that. I'm going to spend some time talking about hyperbilly. We have mentioned that in our normal newborn, but I want to talk about what happens if we weren't able to, if it gets into that high risk zone and the newborn infections, we've covered a lot. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time talking in this um, video. So HIE, I just put this in here, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. This is the thing that um, is when asphyxia occurs 
when breathing is not established after birth or perinatal insufficient oxygen delivery. And so this is the diagnosis that happens that we worry about um, damage, brain damage has occurred. And so seizure activity is um, normally associated with this shortly after delivery. And this is the thing that we, that all labor and delivery nurses are afraid of. If, if you're gonna go to court, if, is most likely going to be related to HIE. So I just wanted you to know the term and be familiar with it, but we're not going to spend too much time on that here. Transient tachypnea of the newborn. This is mild respiratory distress, and we frequently see this in babies born by cesarean section because, like I said before, they don't get that squeeze, and it takes some time for them to push that fluid out. So we are going to be watching for nasal flaring, watching for retractions, watching for grunting on expiration. All of these are signs of respiratory distress and they may come and go. In the first couple of hours after delivery, you may see a little of this and it's to be expected, but after that transition period, we should not see that anymore. And what can happen is a baby that is having transient tachypnea can move into respiratory distress fairly quickly. So this is a baby that needs to be watched a little, clo little more closely. And so our nursing management here is going to be oxygenation. We want these babies to be um, supported if they need to be. They might be given IV fluids or gavage feedings because the baby can't suck if it's working hard to breathe and it is um, using all of his accessory muscles and um, is breathing very fast. So that's possible that we might be supporting their feeding that way. And we wanna make sure that they're not too cold. We wouldn't wanna cold stress them. A grunting, retracting, nasal flaring baby is never going to be bathed. Bathing can always wait. We do not, do not want to cold stress them anymore. Respiratory distress syndrome would be moving up into that next category. And so here you're going to see nasal flaring, chest wall retractions, seesaw respiration, central cyanosis. All of these will tell us that this baby is working hard to breathe. And this is from immaturity and our lack of surfactant. So remember with our preterm baby, we may, our, our preterm, imminent preterm delivery, we may give mom some corticosteroids to try to increase that surfactant within the newborn. But if delivery happens too quickly, it may or may not help. We, they can actually give some um, surfactant after the baby is born. They actually put it down an ET tube and put it into the lungs. Um, but that's beyond the scope of this course. Here is a, um, a scoring system to look at your respiratory distress. And so if you get the opportunity to see a baby that's being supported in the NICU, having the respiratory system, um, try to see if the baby is exhibiting any of these signs, because it would be great for you to see that and know what to look for in your normal newborn assessments out on the floor. These are the different ways that we might support this baby. This baby is intubated the old fashioned way with an ET tube. This baby has a high flow on and this baby has CPAP on. Meconium aspiration syndrome, again, if this baby's had a, a bowel movement inside the womb, if it's super thick, um, we don't want them to take a big deep breath because it gets down into the trachea windpipe and kind of acts like glue. Um, we have ways of mitigating this. If we know about it beforehand, sometimes we will do an amnio infusion to try to wash it out. There are certain, um, tools and techniques they will use right at delivery to try to prevent this. It's not always preventable, but we absolutely do try. Other conditions, like I said, NAC, um, PIH, periventricular or intraventricular hemorrhage, infant of our diabetic mother, and newborns of substance abusing mothers. So spend some time in your chapter here looking at um, the withdrawal assessment and looking at the scoring system that we use. Any baby that has been exposed to substances during um, pregnancy is going to have to withdraw from those substances once it's born. And there's some very specific behaviors that they exhibit and there's some specific ways that we treat those. If you get the opportunity in um, 
important to spend some time with these babies in the NICU. They, we do promote comfort, lots of snuggling um, with these babies. We try to decrease the stimuli, making sure their environment isn't too exciting, um, sounds, touch, color, um, that sort of thing, because that will help them calm. Sometimes we actually have to give them narcotics to help them um, through the first couple of days of withdrawal. This is a good part of your chapter and you wanna spend some time here. Birth trauma, these are things that we were talking about in some of our other lectures. And so some of the things that can happen are fractures, typically either to the skull or to the um, arms and legs. That brachial plexus injury is um, the thing we're most concerned about that can lead to something called Herb's palsy. Um, head trauma, either cephalohematomas or caput. Caput is swelling underneath the skin, not usually associated with blood. And cephalohematoma is a deeper swelling and is associated with broken blood vessels. So one of the assessment tools we use is if the um, hematoma crosses the suture lines, then we are concerned that it's a cephalohematoma and we may have to go further and do some other testing to make sure that there's not um, pressure on the brain. So that shoulder dystocia is the thing that we worry about, that brachial plexus complex. We don't want to pull on this baby and cause damage to that brachial plexus complex. If we do, it can lead to something called Herb's palsy. And this is actually a picture of a man that has herbs palsy and this arm is not functional. And this was um, a birth injury. And here's another picture of an assessment. So after we've had a shoulder dystocia or a difficult delivery, we are always going to do our assessment on our baby. And one of the things we look for is do they have symmetric movement of that arm? Now, occasionally this little nerve will be kind of shocked from delivery and eventually this baby will start moving this arm. But if there's no movement of this arm whatsoever, we're suspicious that that um, brachial plexus has been damaged. And of course, this would be you know, reported to either the neonatologist in the NICU or the pediatrician caring for this baby. So when we're talking about hyperbilirubinemia, this is one of the things I've seen in my career that has really changed. In the old days, we used to just look at these babies and say, eh, you're not too um, jaundice, you're fine. We'll just head on home. And we used visual inspection as a way of determining the jaundice level. That is absolutely not appropriate. And we don't do that anymore. If you read about visual inspection, what they're referring to is obviously, if you see a baby that looks like this, then yes, this baby is jaundice but we're not going to just use visual inspection to try to determine the jaundice level. So physiologic jaundice peaks at about the third to fourth day of life. And this is a, a traffic jam of red blood cells that are breaking down and the byproduct of breaking it down is bilirubin. The bilirubin is what causes the yellowing tint to the skin, but it's also toxic in high levels. So if that bilirubin in the blood is um, very high levels, then we're going to see potentially move into the zone of connectress, which causes brain damage. Fantastic video on the internet called Prevent This. It's a little um, dated, but it shows you the evidence-based practice that was put into place over the last 20 years, and we can prevent every case of connectress based on the protocol that they have developed. I highly recommend it. It's nine minutes and well worth it. So babies that are at higher risk for developing connectress or being in that high risk zone it are babies that have an RH incompatibility or an ABO incompatibility. So babies that have different blood types than their parents, ABO or RH um, negative, or positive, sorry, RH negative um, moms and RH positive babies, that we are at higher risk for developing jaundice. So our risk factors are looking at their prenatal history, and then we're going to do bilirubin levels. And based on those, we're going to determine what risk zone they're in. So if we're in the NICU at this point, then we've determined that they're already in the high risk zone. So we want early feeding. We're going to be using phototherapy. Phototherapy, the bilirubin lights, often called bilirubin lights, 
are a special wavelength of light that causes the chemical, uh, chemical reaction of the bilirubin to become water soluble. So now the baby can stool it out, which is the normal way of getting bilirubin out of the body, and also pee it out. So um, th that's what the purpose of bilirubin lights are. That's what they actually do. And NCLEX loves that question. And if all of this is not working, if we're supporting them um, IV, giving them tons of fluids, supporting their nutrition, putting them on bilirubin lights, and their levels are still rising, then they're going to need an exchange transfusion. I've seen exactly one done in 23 years, and um, it was a big deal. It took a lot of manpower to do. So these are Billy lights. These are the ones that you will probably see out on the floor. We call these a Billy blanket. Some places, um, um, some different locations actually have these available to use at home. Um, but what you're probably going to see in the NICU is the overhead Billy lights. And these babies need to have eye protection on. Here are risk factors, uh, more risk factors for developing hyperbilirubinemia. And I just want to point out here that if the more bruising they have, cephalohematoma, the more bruising or that polycythemia that we were talking about, that increases their chance. If they have an infection, if they're an infant of a diabetic mother, if they're premature, if they haven't had great feeding, if they've been super sleepy for whatever reason, if they had a sibling that had jaundice, um, we want to be on uh, the lookout. If you see jaundice on the very first day of life, that is pathological and we need to investigate further. And this is that bilinomograph that we utilize. So every unit should be utilizing this now. It should be part of their practice, but we are going to be watching this baby's bili and are, uh, is somewhere between the 12th and 24th hour. So the first day of life, we're going to be doing a test, either blood or hopefully transcutaneous. Transcutaneous is a little bili meter that we can use. And then we are going to graph what risk zone they're in. And based on what risk zone they fall into is going to tell us where this baby, what, what interventions we need to put into place. And then newborn infections, there's all types, bacterial, fungal, viral, all the different um, uh, same infections that you and I will get, except these babies are at higher risk. If we suspect infection, we're going to always be looking for risk factors. Was the water broken for a long time? Was it a long labor? Um, did mom have infection? We are going to watch for decreased temp, poor feeding, and then our lab that most likely will be drawn is a CBC with a manual differential. And we're looking for C-reactive protein to see if it's elevated. That's a, a test of inflammation and then watching for positive cultures. But cultures take 24 hours for preliminary results and 48 hours for final results. And so we're not gonna just wait. In most cases, if baby is symptomatic, we're going to go ahead and treat. If we don't, we probably won't be successful in um, helping this baby. So we have different times that we're concerned about infection. Congenital is when it's interuterine. Early onset is in that perinatal period and late onset is after the first week of life. And those, the, when you go to peds, you will most likely see the late onset um, infections. Here are some risk factors that increase the chance of having um, sepsis in that newborn. And then a few of the congenital conditions, um, we see neural tube defects. Sometimes there's esophageal or tracheoesophageal um, atresia of fistulas. Those are developmental. Omphalocele or gastroschisis, that is um, in, with the major body organs in the abdomen and um, thoracic area. Sometimes the anus is in perforate, meaning there is no opening. We don't routinely do um, rectal temperatures on newborns anymore, but we are watching to make sure that there is stool. And then sometimes the bladder is um, outside of the body. So all of these different conditions may be present in a baby that is um, in the NICU. And I just wanted you to be aware there's lots of different diagnoses out there. And once these babies go home, they still are preemies. 
And so we need to give very good education, especially right now, we need to be, give very good education that these babies cannot be out in the general public. And so it's perfectly okay, you know, babies are magnets. It's okay to tell somebody, please don't touch my newborn. Please, please don't come near my preemie or have a cute sign like this made um, to keep people away. And hand washing, hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. If you have questions, feel free to reach out.